Hello everyone and um, welcome to our webinar on trademark clearance in Europe. I know it's good morning for some of you who are joining and good afternoon for others, but welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Jason Rawkins and by way of brief introduction, the, the idea for this series of webinars came out of the EU Trademarks Guide, which we published earlier this year. Hopefully some of you will have seen that already. If anyone hasn't and would like a copy of that guide, just send us an email and we'll send one out to you. So this is the first webinar in the series. You haven't missed anything. Um, and clearance seemed a very good place to start. We'll send out details of our next webinar probably just after Christmas. So when is EU trademark clearance relevant? Well, it's relevant if you're expanding into the European Union for the first time from another country, or perhaps you're already doing business in part of the EU, but you're looking to expand into other parts. It's actually surprising how many non-EU businesses expand into Europe without doing proper clearance in advance and then run into trouble because someone else owns trademark rights which can block them. I guess it's a fairly easy mistake to assume that because you've used your own name in your own country or your own territory for a number of years, it must be okay to use it in a different territory. And of course, that's not always the case. So why do we need a whole webinar on EU clearance? Isn't it just another territory like any other? Well, the answer is that clearance in Europe is surprisingly complex and full of traps for the unwary. On the one hand, the EU is one block of countries with some harmonized laws and procedures. That includes the option of a single trademark registration which covers the whole of the EU. But on the other hand, each EU country also likes to maintain a degree of independence. And speaking from London, um, one could say some more than others when it comes to independence. So the end result of that is that it's not just one set of single European rights to look into, but 28 different countries, or soon to be 27. And on top of that, you've got over 20 different languages going on in the European Union as well. The consequence of that is that there are national quirks, national oddities, when it comes to both procedure and law, and all of that means that without the right advice, it's actually very easy to get things wrong. So the aim of this webinar uh, is to give you a, a general overview of the main issues. Um, needless to say, in one hour, um, we're not going to be able to delve into depth on, on all of them, but we will at least give you an overview so you know the main things to be aware of. We'll try and cover some particular points that may not be obvious if you've not done an EU clearance before. And we'll suggest some pragmatic ways you can go about clearance in a, in a cost-effective way. So by way of agenda, uh, myself and my colleague Tom Carl are going to cover the general points that apply across the European Union. And then I'm delighted to be joined by three Taylor Western colleagues, um, Ortrun in Germany, Franz, who is based in London but is a French qualified practitioner, and at Martin in the Netherlands. And they will cover some specific issues which can arise both in those jurisdictions and in some other ones as well. There's a fair bit of ground to cover, so excuse us for pressing ahead 
um, reasonably quickly to make sure that we can get through things in the time that we have available. Okay, so what are you looking for, or I suppose hoping to avoid, when you carry out a trademark clearance before launching a new product or a new service name in the EU? Well, there are two types of possible blocks. The first being, are you able to get a trademark registration for your name? And usually more crucial, are you able to use your name without fear of being sued or injuncted and prevented from doing so? So it's both registration and use. In terms of what can block you, the most obvious start point is existing registered trademarks or applications for them. And it's really important to note here that there are in fact two types of trademark systems running in parallel with each other within Europe. So you start with European Union trademarks, EUTMs, they used to be known um, as CTMs. They are single trademark registrations covering the whole of the European Union. So that's fine and clear. But separately and in parallel, there are national trademarks in any one of the 28 EU countries. So it's not good enough when you're doing a clearance just to look at the EUTMs. You also need to look beyond that at the national trademarks as well. And of course, there are international trademarks designating either of those two, either an EU or a national trademark in an EU country. In terms of how close those earlier trademarks need to be, they don't need to be identical in terms of mark or identical in relation to services. Um, they can be similar as well. And in fact, you can even have an earlier block of a trademark which is for different goods or services if it's a mark with a reputation. And beyond that, not just registered rights, you have to be aware of unregistered trademarks and that varies according to which EU country you're talking about. Beyond trademarks then, whether registered or unregistered, there are other things which can block you um, within the European Union, and we will come on to some of those later on. But in brief, company names themselves can block you in some EU countries. We have things called geographical indications, which Autrin will touch on when she comes to her part. But to give you a quick example, Champagne, um, the famous drink, is a protected name, which means it cannot be used by anyone else unless it is for that specific drink made in that specific region of France in the particular way in which it is made. Design registrations could also be relevant, particularly obviously if you're clearing a logo. People may have a design registered which is similar, even if they don't have a trademark. And we'll hear from our later speakers about a range of specific national rights which can crop up um, country by country across Europe. Okay, so what can those earlier rights block? We've spoken about a variety of them. Well, starting with the, I guess, the easiest, um, or at least the widest, EU trademarks, the single trademark registrations we were mentioning, that will block someone coming later wishing to either register or use their trademark anywhere in the EU, even if it's a national application, for example, in, in France. National rights, on the other hand, um, whether that's a, a national trademark registration or a use of an unregistered trademark right in a particular country, 
the general rule there is that they, because they're country specific, they're only going to block registration or use um, of someone coming in later in that particular country. But having said that, any national right will block an application for an EU TM registration. So for example, you may come along, have no intention of doing business in Greece, um, but have a plan to do business across several other countries, apply for an EU TM, and still be blocked by someone with a registration in Greece, but nothing else. But you do have at that point the option of converting your application. So if you find a block having applied for an EU TM in a couple of countries, you can transform or convert that original application into national applications um, in the other countries which aren't affected. Okay, so who can block you? We've spoken about what can block you and what they can block, but who can do it? Well, I guess the most obvious and easy start point, as you would expect, is that the owner of a relevant earlier right is the main person who can always block you, and that can be blocking your application for a mark or, more importantly, blocking your use. But beyond that, and this becomes a further layer of difficulty, is that um, the IP office itself, in some of the national countries in the European Union, will block you at a procedural level at the stage when your application is examined. So the IPO in question, those that apply, you'll see a list on the slide of the European countries that, where the national offices do that. I think it's about 10 or 11 of them. They will run their own searches of earlier marks and if it finds any, um, unless you can find a way around it, you'll be blocked at that stage by the IPO. The good news is that it doesn't apply at the level of the EU IPO. So for an EU TM, an EU trademark application, the EU IP office does not carry out that kind of process. They will examine your application on absolute grounds, but not in terms of relativity compared to earlier names, and it will be up to the trademark owner itself, the owner of the earlier right, to take positive action to oppose you if they wish to. In terms of what you can do to overcome a problem with the, at the procedural level with, with an IPO, um, sometimes you can amend the specification to take it away from the earlier mark and thereby persuade the IPO to drop their objection. Sometimes, if it's not a clear-cut case regarding how similar the marks are, for example, it can be possible to persuade the IPO that they're wrong and to allow your application to proceed. And lastly, in the right kind of situation, um, you can get a letter of consent from the earlier rights owner. And how easy or otherwise that will be will depend just how close you are sailing into their area of interest and protection which they may have. A few other things to be aware of which are specific EU issues when it comes to clearance. Um, the first, and as some of you will know already of course, um, is that unlike in the USA for example, it's possible in the EU to have a very wide trademark specification for a, a trademark registration. In other words, the list of goods and services covered by a trademark is permitted to be extremely wide. There's two main impacts of that. Firstly, it makes the register of existing trademarks very crowded and not only crowded, but very wide in terms of scope, which in turn makes it more difficult to find free space for you to maneuver to put your trademark into and get it registered. And secondly, it increases the risk of infringing an earlier mark with a very wide scope, even if in fact the owner of the earlier trademark is only 
itself active in a, in a subset or part of the goods and services which it's managed to register. Another point to note, and again a contrast with other jurisdictions such as the USA, is that trademark registrations can act as blocks to both use and registration, even if they're not themselves yet being used. So you can be blocked by a registration that's been sitting there for a, a couple of years with no sign of any use by the owner of that mark, it will still be a valid right. And the only point at which that changes is if five years go by and the registration becomes open to attack for non-use. <coughs> Lastly, we mentioned uh, how many languages we have here in the European Union. Um, and that comes into play because marks can be considered similar where the words themselves um, are not the same or, or particularly similar in terms of how they're written but have the same or a similar conceptual meaning in another language. So as a simple example, a French registration for PAPA, P-A-P-A, -A, would be able to block a subsequent for example, EU trademark application for the English word father, um, which has the same meaning, obviously, as French papa. So it's another, another thing to be aware of. Well, that's enough for me for now. I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Tom Carl, who's going to take you through different ways of how you can go about trademark clearance. Thanks, Jason. So I'm going to cover the scoping and stages of trademark clearances. Now, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to clearing brands. One of the main challenges is navigating the overcrowded EU trademark market, which Jason mentioned. So just to give you an idea, around 120,000 EU TMs are registered on average every year. There's around 600,000 marks on the, EU, on the UK register. And on top of that, you've got registrations in the other 27 EU member states and youth and other rights across the EU. So comprehensively clearing every new brand in that environment can be cost prohibitive. And it's rare for a clearance to disclose absolutely zero risks. So scoping clearances usually involves assessing the risk profile for each new brand and the level at which the business wants to clear the potential risks and then tailoring each search accordingly so that the clearance is as practical as possible and to allow you to keep costs as manageable as possible. And that involves considering four main parameters on a case-by-case -case basis. First, the commercial importance of the brand, then the type of trademark, then the goods or services of interest, and finally, the relevant EU territories. So looking first at the commercial importance of each brand, a brand's risk profile and the level at which it should be cleared will usually be at the top end of the scale for house marks, other core brands, high profile launches, and long term brands. Whereas it will usually be at the lower end of the scale for lower profile or shorter term sub brands. And when scoping the search, a useful question to ask the business can be in a worst case scenario, if there were to be a serious challenge, how difficult, costly, and embarrassing would it be to rebrand? So for example, will the brand be non-core and only appear online or on limited product stocks and advertising, and therefore relatively painless to withdraw? Or would the stakes be much higher than that? Major launches may need business buy-in for a commensurate clearance budget. But with the right strategy, budgets can be kept re reasonably lean for a range of other launches. The next thing to consider is what type of brand we're dealing with. Most new brand launches will focus on clearing word elements, but additional searches may be needed to clear the stylistic elements of a word mark. For example, if you have a particularly distinctive font or other nonverbal elements, including logos, get up, colors, and shapes. 
and clearing marks in the EU with, as Jason mentioned, it's more than 20 languages, can also require a multilingual approach. So if the brand will have different local versions in individual countries, for example, I'm loving it in the UK and c'est tout ce que j'aime in France, you'll need to consider clearing each version. Even if there will only be one pan-EU version, you may still need to consider whether earlier marks consisting of translations of the brand could block you. Also, if the brand includes a descriptive element, which is unlikely to be blocked by earlier marks in one EU language, it's not always safe to assume this will be true throughout the EU. For example, the EU Court of Justice has held that a Spanish mark for donuts blocked a later EUTM for bimbo donuts both in relation to donuts, because donuts is not descriptive in Spanish. Next, um, comprehensively clearing a brand in all 45 classes of goods and services will generally be unnecessary from a risk perspective and cost prohibitive. As a minimum, identical classes should be covered, but bearing in mind that goods or services falling in the same class aren't necessarily identical or similar, and so might not actually block each other. For example, eyewear and software in class 9, or advertising and accountancy services in class 35. And more extensive searches will usually cover similar or related classes. So for example, legally, a clothing brand in class 25 could block a handbag brand in class 18, or a cosmetics brand in class 3 could block a pharmaceutical brand in class 5, retail of cosmetics in class 35, or beauty services in class 44. And additional limited searches can also be undertaken in classes for dissimilar goods and services in case there are any risky earlier marks with a reputation. Finally, you need to map out which EU territories to cover and how extensively in each case. If the brand is going to be limited to specific EU countries, for example, just the UK and Spain, the clearance can focus on national UK and Spanish trademarks, EUTMs, international registrations designating those three, UK and Spanish use, and business company names and domain names as applicable. If it's going to be a pan-EU brand, comprehensive or different levels of searches will need to be considered across the EU, including, again, EUTMs, national trademarks for all 28 or the most relevant EU countries, international registrations for, for those, and use and other rights in applicable EU countries. In either case, a fully comprehensive clearance may also need to consider the risk of the six-month priority claims arising from other territories. For example, if an Italian or US mark is used to claim priority for an EU TM after the search, this could end up blocking you in the UK and Spain. Or if a South Korean mark is used to claim priority for a German mark or EUTM, this could end up blocking you at an EU level. Now all those parameters feed into the varying levels at which a brand can be cleared, which can themselves be executed in varying stages. Now for all brands, or maybe where the business is considering a short list of brands, the most cost-effective first stage will usually be high-level searches for knockout risks. And in practice, such high-level searches may be sufficient for some lower-risk profile brands. And the first stage can actually start with a basic Google search, which might immediately disclose a well-established, identical brand posing a knockout risk. It can then focus on earlier trademark registrations and applications for mark consisting of or containing identical elements in relation to identical classes and for key territories. Now for EUTMs and individual EU countries, free online searches can be performed directly on certain registers or via the TMVU website. Now we mainly use professional search resources like Thompson CompuMark or CoreSearch, which offer cost-effective and generally more user-friendly and comprehensive search options for those initial searches. If the brand passes that first stage, it can then progress, uh, progress to more comprehensive searches. 
And on a case-by-case -case basis, this can be limited to more cost-conscious mid-level clearances, or it can be extended to full availability searches. And those varying approaches can also be cost-effectively mixed or staggered among different EU territories. Now, these searches go beyond identical knockout trademark registrations applications to cover closely similar or any other potentially similar marks, similar and related classes, potentially identical marks with reputation in all classes, and use or other rights for identical or closely similar marks. Again, we mainly use professional resources like CompuMark and CoreSearch, which offer a range of search options and packages that can be tailored to each clearance. And other specific sources can also be searched where appropriate, so for example, app store and social media searches. So really one of the key messages to take away from this is that although EU clearances can seem and, and be complex, there are various strategies for simplifying the process as much as possible and for managing costs. Okay, I'll now hand you back to uh, Jason. Thanks very much, Tom. So an important area, of course, when you're doing a trademark clearance and you have the search results is to carry out an assessment of what level of risk um, the earlier rights that you find pose to your plans. And the approach we take when we're carrying out this kind of analysis um, is to look at it from two different perspectives of, of risk. Um, the first, and of course, one always has to start by analyzing what we would call the pure legal risk. In other words, what are the earlier marks? How close are they? What do they cover? And how close is that to what we have in mind? And what this will end up telling us is what is the risk ultimately of a court or the IPO deciding against us if, but if is the important word here, the matter would go all the way through to a decision. Some people stop there for ease, but in our view, that's stopping usually much too soon. Because if you do stop there, you could easily end up, in our experience, ruling out a mark on the basis of pure legal risk, when in fact that's not necessary. So the approach we would normally take is to move on from there, having done the pure legal risk analysis, to do some further digging and, and research, and to end up looking at other factors which are relevant and play into what we would call the overall commercial risk. You might call it practical risk or real-world actual risk that's posed. And what we're saying here is, what is the risk of an earlier rights owner not only objecting, but also, having objected, not being willing to either back off, um, be persuaded to drop their objection, or agree some kind of sensible terms of coexistence which allow you to proceed with your plans. And it's pretty common, we would say, that you start with um, some pure legal risks which are relatively high, and end up concluding that actually the overall commercial risk is relatively low, and that's why those two stages are important. In terms of factors that can come into play when you're assessing the overall risk um, part of things, there's a real mix that can come up, but just to touch on some of the, the main factors that you would typically look at, the first is, well, is the earlier mark which poses this high legal risk more than five years old? Uh, as you probably know, if a mark's not used for five years, then it can be attacked for non-use and is open to cancellation. On top of that, we, we mentioned earlier how wide the specifications can be of trademark registration. And if a mark's more than five years old, but actually its owner has only used it for certain specific goods or services, then you should be in a position to feel comfortable that if it came to a fight, then that registration could be partly cancelled and limited down to the 
specific goods or services for which it's actually been used. Second factor, and this is the case even if a, a mark is less than five years old, is it actually being used? Again, some people I think in our experience will find an earlier trademark that's less than five years old, that so can't be attacked yet, and which poses a high legal risk, and then conclude that they've got to move on and change their plans and not launch under their planned trademark. But in our view, that's wrong in so far as that goes to reach that conclusion too quickly um, because the overall risk may still turn out to be manageable. So for example, you may have a trademark registration that's say three years old um, and you look into it and you find it hasn't been used by the owner yet and on further research perhaps there's no indication that the owner has got any plans to start using it. Well then commercially you end up reaching a fairly confident conclusion, not guaranteed of course, that the risk that that mark poses must be quite low because it seems very much that the owner of it has lost interest or never gone through with its interest in using that trademark. And if it's lost commercial interest, then it's obviously much less likely to be willing to spend money to take prolonged action against your plans. If the mark is actually being used, what's it being used for? I touched on that earlier. You may find that it's registered for an extremely wide specification, but in fact only being used for something much more specific. So to give an example of that, a classic example might be a class nine registration for computer software, something that you can get registered with that scope in, in the European Union. Now, the owner may, in fact, be in the business of air traffic control, for example, and using the software may be for that, whereas what you've got in mind is a software package for providing accountancy services. So at that point, you obviously reach the position that, well, potentially they may be able to come against us, but are they really going to want to spend a lot of money having a fight with us when we pose no commercial conflict to them at all? A couple of other points to bear in mind is which country is the owner of the earlier mark based in? It may seem a strange thing to raise, but there's certainly a practical issue that some countries in the European Union have trademark owners that are more inclined and do more typically either oppose trademark applications or indeed take infringement action because they take a more extreme or more protective view of their rights and perhaps you know it's cheaper to do so in that jurisdiction. So German companies, Spanish companies often come up on oppositions for example um, more so than perhaps others. Those are just examples but it's the kind of thing to take into account. And secondly no matter where the company is based how litigious are they in practice? How commonly do they file oppositions? Um, and perhaps what happens to those oppositions, how commonly do they bring court cases? And it's possible to look into that using various tools. For example, DARTS is a, a very useful one that many practitioners use, which will enable you to search by owner and see just how many cases it's been involved with. In terms of what you can do if you know the commercial risk still looks on the high side, the overall risk, and you want to do something to try and lower that. Again, each case is going to depend on its own specifics, but there are a few things to raise as um, options which can come up. One is to keep your specification narrow and specific to what you have in mind. And the, the main reason for doing that, first of all, is you may get around the scope of an earlier mark that's otherwise a problem but also it gives a clear pointer to anyone who comes across your trademark what you have in mind. And if what you have in mind is very different to their area of business, that's going to reassure them and make it less likely that they'll come after you. The second option you have is to adjust the trademark itself. 
um, either adding a word to it or perhaps adding a logo to make it a little bit more different. Or in some cases, you may decide to adjust the word itself a little bit to take it further away from earlier rights that you found. The third one you'll see mentioned on the slide there is often not possible because of timing. Um, it depends how quickly marketing departments come to their lawyers. Um, but if you can do it, whereby you file your trademark applications for what you have in mind, and you have a sufficient gap in time before you actually start use until the opposition periods have passed by, then it goes without saying you're going to be in a more informed position, depending on whether or not anyone has raised any objections or filed any oppositions during that period. If no one does, or if the key earlier rights only are worried about doesn't get involved by filing an opposition, there's no guarantee, but you're going to feel certainly more comfortable about the risk going forward. Another tactic which can work is that an earlier mark may be open to either cancellation for non-use or perhaps part cancellation. And most earlier rights owners don't like um, having their rights curtailed. Um, and that can often be a useful negotiating tactic in return for letting them, or them letting you rather, come into um, their space with the plans that you have in mind. Something that can work sometimes, it's at least worth being aware of. Um, we've certainly used it successfully on occasion, is perhaps you can purchase an earlier mark. Um, and by that, we mean a mark which predates the blocking mark that you're most concerned about, perhaps because the very earliest mark isn't being used anymore. So let's, um, to use a topical example, let's assume your, your planned trademark is Trump, and you find an earlier blocking trademark which dates from 2014, that you can't see any way of attacking that mark, um, but then you find another third earlier trademark registration for Trump from, say, 2010, hasn't been used, it's therefore you know, open to attack, but perhaps you can purchase it, and by then using it yourself, you make that mark valid again because it's, it's no longer an issue of non-use, but at the same time you buy yourself a right which comes before the trademark that would otherwise block you. And last but not least, well, actually last and least, to be fair, because it often doesn't work, is you have got the option, of course, of approaching the earlier rights owner yourself, being proactive about it, and seeking their consent. It's not normally something we do, except in unusual circumstances, simply because you're raising the issue with them when they may not have been bothered about it, and however you phrase it, you're going to be admitting in some shape or form that you're worried about them, which is going to make them think, well, perhaps there's a reason for that. But um, it can work, but usually a bit of a last resort. Okay, I'm going to hand you over to um, Ortrun in Germany, who's going to cover various national rights, not just German ones, but um, particularly Germany, to give you a flavour of some additional things which can crop up um, on a national basis. Thank you, Jason. Um, I would like to talk about rights other than registered trademarks first. Um, most of these rights have in common that they are different in all the EU member states as their laws have not been harmonized to date. And obviously, they also have in common that they can be an obstacle to the use and registration of your trademark or otherwise you would not include them in our webinar. Probably the most important IP right here is that of trade names because they are protected in most EU member states. What are trade names? Trade names are names used to designate a business that can be in the form of a company name, which is the official name of a business as registered in the commercial register. It can be an establishment name of a business which is not even registered. And it can be any other name or designation used by a business as a business identifier. Both the requirements of obtaining protection and the scope of protection vary from country to country. 
In some countries, for example, registration in the commercial register is necessary. In others, a certain degree of market recognition is needed. Countries that offer protection to trade names include, um, but this is not an exhaustive list, Austria, Portugal, the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Finland, and Sweden. All Benelux countries offer protection to trade names, but different from the Benelux trademark law, the protection is not uniform. Italy only protects well-known trade names, and Germany offers a very high level of protection. Protected are all kinds of trade names used in trade by the business to designate itself. The registration in the commercial register is not necessary, but it is also not enough. <clears throat> so the name must actually be used. And um, protected can also be a company's logo. For local transactions, think ice cream parlor, only local protection is afforded. And interesting enough, in the UK, a trade name is not a right on its own. Another IP right is the title of work. Um, it can be the title of a magazine or any other publication of a film, a TV show or series, a game, a software, or even an app. Again, Germany offers a very high level of protection for titles. Protection is possible for titles of work of all kinds of work categories, and it's similar to that of the trademark protection. The threshold for passing the absolute ground test, though, is much lower for titles than it is for trademarks. And many titles of newspapers, magazines, or newscasts enjoy protection as a title of work, um, where you would think they are more or less descriptive. Examples are auto motor sport for a cars magazine or art for an arts magazine. As to the priority date, as a rule, the publication date is relevant. <laughs> However, the title may enjoy an earlier priority than that. Um, in case of the so-called notice of title protection has been published prior to the publication of the actual work. And this is a pre-use advertising, including information about the format of the anticipated work along with its title. And that can be done up to six months prior to the publication of the actual work. And how can you search this? There are special title searches available, but they are not 100% reliable, which is a bit unfortunate. Although we are far from the first in use system of the US, most EU member states do offer trademark protection without registration if certain conditions are met. These conditions, again, vary from country to country, and the threshold is probably lower in the common law countries like the UK than it is in Austria or Germany, where the brand owner must prove that his mark enjoys a certain level of brand recognition. Gathering evidence for a non-registered trademark costs many times more than filing a trademark in the first place, but sometimes it's helpful um, if the exact variant of a brand that should be invoked in case of a trademark infringement litigation has not been filed as a trademark for whichever reasons. Then there are other national rights which may constitute a potential risk for the adoption of a new brand. Let me give you some examples. Estonia protects names of proprietary medicinal products independent from their registration as a trademark. Denmark, shop facades, Greece and other countries, product shapes and get up. And probably the most famous and most difficult to understand, passing off in the UK and Ireland. I also need to mention domain names. 
The registration of the domain name per se does not give an IP right, but depending on national law, the use of a domain name may establish IP rights. In some countries, like France, the domain name, if used, forms its own category of IP right. My partner France will later touch on this. Um, and in countries like Germany, the type of protection afforded by a used domain name depends on what the domain is used for and how it is used. So if the website under the domain name is used by a company to present its goods or services, the use of the domain establishes rights to a trade name. And if the domain name is used as a platform, let's say for a game or for an online magazine, it may enjoy protection as a title of work. Um, another IP right which is often forgotten in trademark clearance but is very relevant is that of geographical indications. Today, pan-EU registrations of geographical indications and appellations of origin are in place for certain products, um, wines, spirits, foodstuffs, and agricultural products. Famous geographical indications such as champagne mentioned by um, Jason earlier, enjoy protection also for dissimilar goods and services. So champagne, shampoo was not a good idea. And um, on, for geographical indications on an EU level, there is a registration system in place. Then there are also national laws of the individual member states. And here some member states have national registration systems. And in other member states, geographical indications on a national level are unregistered rights, for example, in Germany. There are also international agreements. The WIPO administered Lisbon Agreement. Um, then there are bilateral agreements between individual countries and free trade agreements, which usually include GI chapters. So what are the limitations to searches? Searching for trademark registrations and applications has become easy. As Tom mentioned, many good tools and search providers are available on the market. However, even searching trademark registers has its limits. So you cannot find unpublished trademark applications when they are too fresh. And naturally, you cannot find trademark applications which will be filed in the future, but which can still be an obstacle for your new mark if they claim convention priority of a foreign trademark. Um, you can find these only in case um, or by a search in all foreign registers as well. When it comes to non-registered rights, the search become, can become really tricky. So what can you do? You can find most, but not all, trade names by searching among commercial registers and company directories. There's pharma in use information. And you can search in App Store, social media, in Amazon, or do a Google search. Um, all not too reliable. But even some registered rights are hard to find. For example, there are no suitable tools for searching the EU registers for geographical indications, so it is difficult to find designations which are not completely identical. And last but not least, you do not want to wait too long before filing your own trademark application, or otherwise your search will be outdated as others have been faster than you. Apart from conflicts, there are two other issues to be considered in trademark clearance work. One is, is the trademark registrable or is it descriptive or non-distinctive and will therefore not pass the absolute grounds examination? Such a trademark will be hard to enforce later because you don't have a registration. Also, beware of a negative connotation of the trademark in any of the languages in the EU. As mentioned in the beginning, 
We have 20 languages in the EU, and if the trademark has an offensive connotation in one of them, it might not be registrable because it is against public order. That would be the worst case. But even if this is not the case, a trademark having a meaning you do not wish to convey might not become the biggest success. So do make sure your local council makes a language check or run your mark through translation tools. And I now hand over to Franz. Thank you, Tran. I think the first specific issues I wanted to mention for France are that um, we do not have unregistered trademark in France, which makes quite a huge difference to other European countries. In addition, um, it has to be noted that in order to file an opposition to the registration of a mark in France, you have to base your opposition on an earlier registered trademark. Um, and that is the same um, in the Benelux, as we will um, discuss it later with Martin. Then I wanted to look at maybe you know, different specific rights that can block your use and registration in France. So I wanted to uh, just mention company names, and like in Germany, um, they can prevent your use and registration of a mark. Um, company names are registered on the commercial register, um, but the registration is not sufficient. The company names will need to be in use at the time of the filing of the trademark, and it needs to be in use uh, for activities that are going to be considered similar to the goods and services that will be covered by the trademark application. In addition, uh, we are uh, asking that um, the use of this com company name um, you know, and the possible use of similar trademarks create a likelihood of confusion. However, as uh, we know, the owner of a company name cannot file an opposition, so um, he will therefore have to wait for the mark to be registered um, on the French registry and then file a cancellation action based on his earlier company name rights. This action cannot, for the time being, be filed in front of the IPO. It will have to be filed before a court and therefore um, a longer and more costly process than just filing an opposition. In the same way, trading names are uh, also um, able to stop your use and registration of a mark. The additional condition to a trading name compared to a company name is that to block the use of a mark, the trading name has to be known across the national country and not only in a part of the territory. This doesn't mean that the trading name has to be well known, but there is a geographical condition to the use of that particular trading name. Finally, I think I just wanted to touch on domain names. So um, the registration of the domain name is not sufficient to stop uh, your use and registration of a mark. However, um, the domain name needs to be used before the filing of the trademarks. Um, the fact that the website corresponding to the domain name is accessible in France uh, will not be a sufficient condition. The domain name holder will need to show that the goods and services offered via the website are designed to French customer. Um, and I would say that he will have to show that the site is designed uh, design is offering to our customer base in France and possibly other countries, but that is an extra condition that you will have to, to show. Um, on that note, I think that um, that's where the specific issue for France, and then we are going to, uh, I'm going to hand over to Martin so that he can look at the Benelux in more detail. Thank you very much, France. Uh, for a good understanding of, of trademark clearance in the Benelux, it is key to understand that the Benelux is an intergovernmental collaboration between three sovereign countries, being Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. All three countries have their own courts and own official languages, and the Benelux can therefore be considered as a mini-union within the European Union, and has harmonized its trademark laws in the Benelux Convention on Intellectual Property. One of the consequences of this harmonization is that there are no such things as Dutch trademarks or Belgian trademarks. The national trademark for all three countries is now a Benelux trademark, which can be applied for with the Benelux Office for Intellectual Property or by applying for an international registration designating the Benelux. The consequence of 
this all for clearing your trademark in the Benelux is that you legally have to clear only one jurisdiction, but in practice you need to clear three jurisdictions, each with own local unregistered rights and each with its own languages, trademarks with reputation and so on. Probably the most important clearance issue in the Benelux is that you have to take into account that there are five spoken languages in the Benelux, being French, Dutch, German, Luxembourgian and Frisian, which is a Dutch language. But the only two official Benelux languages are French and Dutch. This means that a Benelux trademark can be filed in either the Dutch or French language, but also in English, and that the lists of goods and services of Benelux trademarks found during clearance processes can potentially be in three different languages. The practical implication of being a union of three sovereign countries with two official languages are mainly that a trademark can be refused if it's descriptive for the goods and services applied for in one of both official languages, which is not descriptive in the other language. More important and hard to clear, however, is that different words can be conceptually similar despite the fact that the words are visually and orally completely different. This should definitely have implications in your clearance and search strategy, which should be broadened using local knowledge on the possible conceptual meaning of a word in either French or Dutch, to avoid that a possible conflict will only be discovered, discovered after launch of a trademark. I've included two examples in my presentation on where this issue could arise. Both examples show first the Dutch word, then the French word, and then the English word, which in general will be also be well understood by the Benelux public. You can immediately see where problems might arise if the clearance and search strategy is only aimed at visual and oral similarity with knowledge of the Dutch and French language. The word pomme, for example, is apple in French and will therefore be considered as conceptually similar to apple in English or apple in Dutch. The second example shows the Dutch and French equivalents for car in English, which example also show that the words in the Benelux language can highly differ from each other from a visual and oral uh, perspective. Another important element to take into account when clearing your trademark in the Benelux are local unregistered trade name rights in Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. And as Orteren already mentioned, trade name law uh, is not harmonized in the Benelux as trademark law. And these rights are often unregistered rights, which makes it much harder for you to find them and clear your mark as good as possible without proper local assistance. The first start to clear a trademark in the Benelux is to search the local company names database, but these are not combined uh, in one register as the Benelux trademark register is, and it's therefore very important to have three separate searches for local rights and use of your intended mark. The conclusion is therefore that although we have a harmonized trademark system in the Benelux, in the process of clearing your mark, it's highly advisable to take a three-way approach to the Benelux to avoid any pitfalls regarding local use or unexpected language issues after the launch of your trademark. Thank you very much, Martin. Well, that, that brings us to the close of our webinar today. Um, thank you again for all the participants for joining us. We hope you found it useful. Obviously, we've raised a lot of issues. Um, well, we hope we've raised your awareness at least. But the take-home message, I would say, is that EU trademark clearance is complex, but with the right kind of awareness, which hopefully you now have, and with the right kind of specialist advice, it is perfectly manageable. Thank you too to our panel of speakers for their contributions today. And, and lastly, uh, apologies that we have run out of time to deal with any questions. We're keen to finish on time so that people's diaries are free for their next commitments. But if you do have any questions, please do feel free to contact us and we'll do our best to answer them. And of course, it goes without saying, we would be delighted to assist you um, on any trademark clearance projects you may have. So it's goodbye from all of us at Taylor Westing for today and we wish you a very pleasant remainder of the day. <laughs>